ratings period. Right. Uh, I used to do two or three pieces, and for the two or three weeks leading up to it, I just research. It's wonderful. Oh, how uh, wonderful. You know, yeah, so That's I had great. To, I was away from, no, I have nothing. I have a speech tonight, but no, I have nothing to do. It's, it's really great because I can sit and stop and think about things like this. Great. Think about what I want great. to do. Read, whatever. Uh, and I can uh, catch, and, and, uh, and nobody bugs me. No, I'm, uh, this, <laughs> That's is one, good. this is one of my favorite times of the year <laughs> before these rating periods. <laughs> okay. Well, I wanted to start with, um, it's not, uh, I'm going to take it out of the order here. I was looking at the Junior League uh, video, that uh, great video that they did on Miami. Right. Huh? And, to, and I was very so interested to learn that seven days in, to the new decade, 1970, Judge C. Clyde Atkins made his famous ruling that segregation ends here. There's no more right. dual schools. Right. And I think a lot of people will be, newcomers would be surprised that segregation really only ended here 30 years ago. Right. And do you remember, was that a trauma for our area? Well, this was a typical Deep South community, and they resisted the Supreme Court ruling in 1954 as best they could. They kept delaying and uh, using all kinds of other methods to get away from it. And finally, C. Clyde Atkins, who was a uh, very moral person but also very courageous, said, we've got to stop it, and this is the way it's going to go. I'm going to create a plan to desegregate these schools. And by 71, his plan was being acted on. I think it did traumatize a lot of Miamians. Again, you could still hear a lot of Southern accents in the community that late in the century. I've even got pictures of uh, people in Ku Klux. Right. So, uh, so uh, I was sort of it sort of bypassed me. Uh, you ready? Yeah. Uh, a lot of people would be surprised that less than 30 years ago, uh, this was a segregated community before Very much so. before Ed came to. I mean, this, was this a Southern town? This was a Deep South community. You can look at old videos going back to 69, 70, that late, and still hear Southern accents on the part of county and city leaders. Mm -hmm. And so, when it came to desegregation, there was the usual delay as there had been throughout the South. And finally, Judge Atkins, a very courageous, moral person, said we got to do something about this. And he laid out a plan in 1970 and it was affected by 1971. Was it easy or was it hard to, to integrate here? I think it was relatively hard. I really do. The time had come and he understood that too, but I think people resisted right up until the end. And then once it happened, it began to proceed pretty nicely. So that by the 70s, it became a fact of life here. Then you had uh, the black community, which still had trouble getting, uh, getting its due, I think. Uh, whites were leaving the center city, Liberty City, um, Overtown was almost right. destroyed because right. of the expressways and stuff. What happened in the black community about that time? Well, Liberty City was growing tremendously, and Overtown, which had had 40,000 plus people in 1960, was down to 23,000 plus in 1970, primarily because of expressway building. So it's really diminishing. And what's happening to Liberty City is a lot of these adjoining blue collar uh, white neighborhoods, people were bailing out of there, and many African Americans were buying. So that Liberty City was growing immensely at the same time that Overtown was shrinking. Then it was also the time that the the Hispanic, or in fact the Cuban community, was exploding here. Did they become the dominant uh, community in, in the 70s, or were they just? Well, they were really on the cusp. Numerically, they were very close to it at that point, but politically, it would have to wait until the 80s when they began to register in big numbers. I think the the realization that they were going to be here longer than just a brief while hadn't really set in until probably the 70s. And I think in 80s, stung by the reaction of the Montiel vote lift, they really began to register as voters created the Cuban and American National Foundation and really took off. The 70s are growing immensely. Of course, the Freedom Air flights, beginning in 1965 and lasting until 73, fed a few hundred thousand of them to this area. Mm -hmm. So you have a large number. And that's when we first started calling Southwest 8th Street Cayocho. Cayocho. Exactly. Uh, businesses, uh, they had taken over, a business they, they had opened. That street, by the end of the 60s through the 70s, is bustling as a Cuban stronghold. And not just in the center city area, but going west, past the Versailles, past 37th Avenue, out toward the old hinterlands. Did anybody realize that the Cubans were going to be dominant here by the year 2000? I think some people probably did, but really didn't spend too much time thinking about it. I think the fact that the Cubans politically really weren't using their muscle the way they could have based on their numbers was something that held us back from actually realizing potentially how strong they could be. We finally got a Hispanic mayor in the mid uh, middle of the decade, Puerto Rican descent, right. Maurice Ferre. How significant was that? Very significant. Uh, this was one of the first places, major cities, to have a Hispanic mayor. And uh, I think it really symbolized the fact that there were so many Hispanics in the community. His strength was not only in places like Little Havana, but also in Alapata. There were a lot of Puerto Ricans, Wynwood. So he really reached out to a lot of parts of the city that were already Spanish speaking. Miami was sort of slow uh, in the 60s getting up to speed with things like hippies and free love, but they caught up in the 
in the 70s. And I think the, we had these two political conventions, and this area was overrun with the hippies and yippies. What yeah, was that like? Well, that was the last hurrah, I think, for the counterculture was the 72 political nominating conventions, Democrats and Republicans. And they came down in huge numbers. They came down to protest that lingering Vietnam War. Uh, it was centered essentially on the beach, but you had a large hippie community then in Coconut Grove and in some other parts of greater Miami. And uh, the place was overrun, the beach was in particular, by hippies. And I think for a lot of people, it's like, my God, what has happened here? But you're right, it did come late to this area. At the South Beach area at that time was still what it was always had been, a, a lot of old retired people from the North, mostly Jewish. Uh, but the Art Deco idea hadn't caught hold just yet. When did it catch hold in the 70s? Well, uh, Barbara Kappelman, who had come down here on her honeymoon in 1938, came back in the early 70s when her husband had an appointment at FIU, brand new university. And she wandered over there because they had honeymooned over there. She said, my God, they're all still here, these wonderful streamlined buildings. What can I do to preserve them? And it was an enclave of very elderly people. And so she organized within four years of seeing those. In 1976, the Miami Design Preservation League, they secured a grant of money to survey an area for a proposed historic district, which they did, applied for national designation in 1979, and got it by the middle of 79. And so that was the turnaround. But it would take another, I'd say, eight or nine years for that district to really become vibrant and viable. But this was the beginning, then, of the preservation of that very large district over there on the beach. Why was there so much resistance from particularly developers to the concept of Art Deco South Beach? They didn't see the value in this historical architecture at all. They also had their own schemes. One scheme at the same time the district was coming together was to canalize yeah. South Beach to make still another Venice of America. Mm -hmm. And so there was a great resistance on the part of officialdom. And in fact, they didn't protect those buildings. That's one reason why the New Yorker went down later and the senator went down. There was no local protection until the last decade or so for those buildings. We had uh, a president who lived here, Nixon. Did that, um, did that have any impact at all on our area in South Florida? I think it did. It brought uh, all sorts of uh, media attention to the area. It uh, transformed Key Biscayne from one red light to many red lights. It closed off some streets. Um, and I think it especially did during the height of Watergate. He took refuge here again and again and again with his buddy B.B. Rebozo and some of his staff. But uh, this was the Winter White House, and you had that dateline coming out of Key Biscayne. I don't think a lot of people realize it, even those who lived here a long time, that Watergate, was, the story was broken in Washington, but the first key evidence was right here in Miami with Richard Gerstein's office. Exactly. We had four people involved in that break-in, Cuban refugees, who came from Miami. They were part of that. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of Watergate activity going on here. I remember this place was crawling with newsmen from everywhere during that time. Investigating the early parts of Watergate because of the background of some of these people. <laughs> the really, another real downer was drugs. Uh, we started seeing these drug shipments coming in in the 70s. Do you recall what happened, why, why, why they suddenly started showing up? I don't recall them coming in like that before the 70s. Well, uh, the area's location. Uh, the same reason that this had been a prime entry point for illicit alcohol from 1920 to 33 made it the same thing for drugs beginning in the 1970s. And you begin to see the, uh, the Mutiny Hotel open in 68. Within a matter of a handful of years, you're getting this stereotypical Colombian drug dealer hanging out at the bar there. By the late 70s, you've got these, this syndicated drug ring here, and you've got shootouts. The most notorious, of course, being at Dadeland with the cocaine cowboys pulled up in that van filled with weapons and started a shootout there. Mm -hmm. um, location, I think, had the prime, was the prime reason for this area being besieged by drugs. Mm -hmm. What, now, there were some really some happy occasions. The Miami Dolphins went to three Super Bowls and went undefeated. Do you recall what that did for this community? This community has always been hard to bring together. It did really brought us together. People with Southern accents, African Americans, Hispanic accents, old people, young, all came together behind those Dolphins. You couldn't get around that Orange Bowl on game day. It was so busy. Mm -hmm. I wish the Orange Bowl was still there. I <laughs> certainly do. I love the place. Love it. Entertainers. I recall my daughter would go nuts whenever I told her one Sunday I was going to cover KC and the Sunshine Band on the pier at South Beach. Right. Uh, do you recall when that group came out of Hialeah and, and went, went global? Well, they, it's a late 60s and early 70s group, and we like it because it's homegrown. And I love the idea of them using that South Beach pier, which is no longer there. I mean, the idea they would use that is amazing compared with today with this high-tech sort of thing people have. But uh, we did have some homegrown entertainment. The Rhodes Brothers from the 60s and 70s, oh, yeah. uh, Nita Bryan, who had adopted this place as our home, controversially so. Mm -hmm. But we had a lot of homegrown stuff here. Speaking of Nita Bryant, uh, toward the uh, end of the decade, the 77, 78 area, she uh, gets involved with gay rights. Um, 
What was the significance? Uh, they, they, they got the law overturned here, but it was a bigger national significance to to what happened, I think the attention. Well, it really focused, uh, it focused attention, A, on this community, but also focused attention on this whole issue of gay rights, uh, which went from there to many other communities, not just the controversy, but many ordinances that were passed in other places that would uphold certain gay rights, and that's an ongoing story. As for Anita Bryant, that was probably the end of her career, mm -hmm. beginning the end anyway. Mm -hmm. Did that, did it, would it have anything to do with um, creating the gay community in Miami today as we know it? Well, you know, Stonewall in New York, the bar in 69, uh, was the starting point for that. And I really think that here, and that happened in the late 70s, that really triggered this gay awareness. And that gay awareness was really manifest in a lot of places, including the whole revival of South Beach. Mm -hmm. But I think it did bring together a lot of gay people, and it brought a lot of gay people out, as it were. Mm -hmm. You know, not to hide behind the Anita Bryant, but to get out there and just show people who they were. Another thing that many of us didn't know how to deal with as journalists or otherwise was feminism uh, in the person of a right. Roxy Bolton. She's an amazing person and she went out there and said, look, it's time. You know, there's been other liberation movements, now we're here. And within that decade, it wasn't just Roxy, but many people began to assume prominent positions like a Janet Reno and an Athlete Range and an Alice Wainwright would hold tremendous political and law, legal positions in the community. Miami, uh, before the 70s, and I know when I was doing the 60s series, you couldn't find examples, activist uh, examples. I mean, they were going on around the country, but it was hard to find activists in feminism, activists in gay rights. Right. What happened in the 70s that brought these people out and suddenly we were activists too? Well, I think we had grown to be a much larger area than we ever were before. I think there was just so many opportunities for people because of the liberation movements of the 60s, such as civil rights and what have you, for people to assume that. But the trigger for Bob Kuntz would have been the Anita Bryan actions and overturning that thing. And the trigger for Roxy Bolton would have been, it's time. You know, we can't continue to be discriminated against. I just think the time had come, the area had gotten large enough and diverse enough where people were stepping forward, and the opportunities were there for that. Uh, the whole 60s thing, I think, gave birth to fearless activists, and we finally caught on to it by the 70s. Education was pretty, uh, got uh, a lot of attention. Uh, Miami Dade downtown Absolutely. was created. It sure was. But Too. Yeah, and and that's grown to be University. one of the largest ones around. Mm -hmm. What was the significance of the, both the downtown and expansion of Miami-Dade in general and having FIU come here? Well, the FIU thing symbolized a lot of things. That We were getting more wallop in the legislature. The pork choppers had dominated the legislature and had put this area down for eons. With reapportionment in the 60s, <laughs> we're getting more representation. We're able to push through for a state university. Can you imagine an area this large without a state university until 1972? That was the case. Mm -hmm. As far as Miami-Dade downtown goes, this community college was the largest community college in the nation and in the world. And it decided it needed a good downtown presence, which has been a great thing for this downtown area. Was Miami keeping up with the rest of the nation by the 70s? As I said, in the 60s, uh, it, they didn't seem to be staying up with the nation. They were still more interested in sun and fun. But by the 70s, do you think they were caught up? I think it's pretty much into the mainstream. I think by the 80s and 90s, in many ways, it's ahead of a lot of the nation in so many ways. People come down here and divine this as a city of the future, in fact. But I think the 70s was that big decade when it did catch up. It did get serious. It was, in terms of critical mass, big enough to begin to flex its muscles around. What about the... Uh And I said, Don, nothing's happening here. I said, oh, wait a minute. This decade of bond progress, decade of progress bond issue has been fantastic. You wait to see what's going to happen in the next 10 or 20 years. And he's right. Uh, I think a lot of things have benefited from that. A lot of us have benefited from those bonds. Mm -hmm. What about Broward? Was, you know, Broward, until recently, always sort of lagged behind Miami-Dade. And now it's up on a par, perhaps. What was going on in, in Broward at that time? Well, I think the number one thing about Broward at the time was growth. Keep in mind that Broward County's population as late as 1940 was somewhere around 50,000 people. Uh, ...damaged airplanes and to put into place corrective solutions. The experts will get the data they need to stay in front on safety. President Clinton is encouraging all airlines to do what American Airlines is doing. It developed the Aviation Safety Action Program, ASAP for short. 
It brings together in one room pilots who report anything they see that might be a problem, including their own mistakes, the airlines, which investigate, and the FAA, which grants pilots immunity from punishment as long as the mistakes aren't the result of drugs or alcohol. New directives are then sent to everyone in aviation. Restaurants and entertainment along that beautiful river there. That's one thing. The beach, which was world famous by that time, has really declined tremendously. There's still. And the fact that after all of these struggles, blacks were empowered to the degree where they could elect a city commissioner who was not only black but a woman. Mm -hmm. She came up from Key West uh, many years before that and really took her place among the, the giants here. Do you remember the gas crisis back in 73, 74? Sure do. The first time I ever saw people I thought were going to kill themselves, at, uh, kill each other at, at gas pumps. Right. Well, again, being a suburban sprawl in greater Dade County and Broward County, people are very vulnerable to that. If you're living way out there in the suburbs, and at that point, way out might have been 87th Avenue or 107th Avenue, you're coming into work, there's a real problem there, and there's no mass transit to speak of. Cruise ships really accelerated. We'd had right. cruise ships, but they really grew in that decade. Well, I think because Carnival Cruise really came on board at that point. It began, it was a young company at that point, and it really grew that uh, decade and made this huge commitment uh, to stay here and to create more and more ships. And so it really became a great decade for cruise ships. By the 80s, I mean, everything's launched. That's on its way to becoming the number one cruise ship port in the world. Mm -hmm. Provided they don't try to tax yeah, the, for tax. the stadium. Oh, Lord help us. <laughs> Lord help us. Like first um, downtown Renaissance. Downtown's interesting. I can, it's one of my favorite places to study. In some ways, downtown was dying in the 70s. And in other ways, it was being reborn. The Knight Center, uh, they had cleared some old buildings on the river for the Knight Center uh, and for the future Hyatt Regency. They had saved the Gusman Center, which was going to be a parking garage. Believe it or not, they're going to level and build a parking garage. They had built the Omni, which opened in 77. And that whole area looked like it was taking on a renaissance. And yet, in between all of that was the death of, say, the Northeast 2nd Avenue corridor as it moves north into the Omni, would have been a bunch of businesses. And just neighborhoods were gone. Urban renewal had leveled these things and businesses elsewhere had put them out of business. Uh, so you've got a tremendous mix. You've got retail turning seedy downtown, but you've got some real signature buildings beginning to arise too, which I think is symptomatic of a lot of American downtowns. Is there a big difference between the 70s and today here in South Florida? Very significant. So much more Hispanic today in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. Very different. Mm -hmm. And when we do the story 25 years from now, we'll be talking about the Hispanic achievements of South Florida, I guess. Oh, absolutely, in a big way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for what, sure. What have we forgotten? Anything off your list? I think we've got well, we, I think we covered us. almost everything. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we really did in, in pretty rapid fashion, too. What's your bottom? Um, take a look there, and I'll ask you one final one. How about that Brickell Avenue transformation? I yeah, oh, yeah. Really when, I first, interesting. when I first came here, there were, there were still. Uh, Beautiful homes on Brickell Absolutely. Avenue near the river. For sure. What happened to all those homes? The transformation of Brickell Avenue takes place in the 70s. Prior to the 70s, there were about three commercial buildings on Brickell Avenue. At the end of the 70s, essentially all those great old mansions and homes had been leveled, and now one financial building after another is replacing them. Until today, that's the Wall Street of Southeast Florida, mm -hmm. with over 45 banks there, international banks. So the 70s was a huge decade. And what it meant was that Brickell was so important as an attachment to downtown and as a beautiful area along the water that let's not just put a house there. Let's buy the house, put a big building up there in its place, and really maximize our money. Ken, we don't want to go as far as the 80s because we're not there right. yet in this story. How does the 70s stack up against, let's say, the 40s, 50s, and 60s in South Florida as far as a a, a way that this area changed or, or? Well, I see it in a couple ways. Further growth uh, in terms of population and in terms of development, and then some really big demographic changes in terms of Hispanic peoples. Another large element that begins to come in in the 70s are Haitian Americans, mm -hmm. beginning about 72. And so by the end of the decade, you've got a considerable number of Haitians, and you also have a growing number of Nicaraguans because of the turmoil in that country. So you've got a growing Hispanic, non-Cuban Hispanic population, a growing Cuban population, and a growing Haitian American population. So that mix, I think, was one of the great uh, pieces of the 70s. Mm -hmm. Great. That's very significant. That's very significant. Okay, I think I've covered uh, Great. Yeah, I've covered most of the. Well, it's fun to talk about these things, isn't it? Oh, it really yeah, is. I love it really it. is. I'm always reflecting on them anyway. Well, you know, um, I, I, um, I like to talk about them and I love to report on them. And fortunately, for, Jeff, we're basically finished. And I, fortunately for me, I work for a station that likes to see reports about them. That's great. They like these, huh? 
They like they like to see flashbacks. They like to That's see. That's great. We love know, it. Like I told and I told them that nobody, of course, had heard of Roxy Bolton. She'd been inactive, and I said, "Listen, Dallas, who uh, started as a young reporter, then came in. And said, oh my God, I'll do that story." <laughs> and so we got out all this old tape of Roxy, and uh, fortunately, uh, finally, they dedicated, they, they donated it to this library, which is the basis. And of we the use library. it all the time. Oh. Uh, Ike, last week I gave a talk at a money laundering conference, and I used some of their tape on Traficante, Lansky, Kefauver, Dan Sullivan. You should have seen the tape that I had. I've got it in my file. I've used fabulous. the stuff. Jeff and I did a, a, a mob story last year. Well, I'd say 400 plus people there. Yeah. So, did you arrange then for the transfer of that film over to Steve Davison? I wouldn't say that I arranged it, but I was you helped one to do of the it. Ones that, was, that helped to, to call and, and, and make sure they understood That's wonderful. what they were That's about.